our own story. Every day God gives us a blank page to write our story. Now I used to think that my story began on April the 12th, 1955. But that's not true. My story actually began nine months before that. Just didn't know about my story at that time. You see, when my mom became pregnant with me, she became sick from day one and she got so sick, she was actually losing weight rather than gaining weight. She was always a small woman. I think maybe she was 90 pounds, you know. By the time she was six months, she was under 90 pounds. And the doctors were so concerned that they were talking about maybe for her own health's sake, it might be best for her to get an abortion. Now, I didn't know any about, anything about this until so years later when I was a teenager. But my, my mom and dad, they, 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 they'd been praying all along, but then they just began to be earnestly praying. They just wanted so bad for, the, for her to be able to keep the baby, so they prayed. And within a few weeks, things began to change, and obviously things got better, and I'm here. I'm here. Now, my story, I thought I knew my story, but when my mom told me that, I realized I didn't know all my story. In fact, I realized there's so much of my story, I, don't, I, I won't never even know my story until I get to heaven. I was very overcome when I discovered that my mom had sacrificed to do what she did to get me into this world and I'm ever so grateful for her faith. But it made me realize something that I didn't know at the time, and that's that parts of our stories we will never know till we get to heaven. And that means there's pages in our stories that we don't write for ourselves. God some, writes some of the pages. Other people sometimes write, like my mom and dad wrote part of my story. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that our stories are more complex than we ever thought they might be. Here's what I know. I believe God has given us freedom to write most of our story in our lives, the choices we make. But I also know this. I know that God wants to be on every page of our story. So with this in mind, what I want to do is I want to take a story each week from the Bible. And as I said, I want to take on the personality that the story I'm telling. And then we're going to talk about what God's trying to tell us. What's the purpose of this story in God's Word? So use your imagination just for a moment. I'm changing from Pastor Tim to somebody else. I won't give you my name right off. My seven brothers had joined the king's army, and I was left, I was the youngest, and I was left behind to take care of my father's sheep. And so, you know... It was kind of a boring job, but every once in a while there was an excitement, but I was really wanting something more to do. And after a few months, my, my dad came to me and said, hey, son, I need you to take your brothers who had been enlisted in the king's army, and they were facing the Philistines once again. I need you to take them some food. I need you to take them some change of clothes and provisions. And so I was so excited for the opportunity. So I said, yes, dad, I'd love to do that. And so I, I went from where we lived in Bethlehem and went to where they were. And when I got there, I found my brothers and I gave them the provisions and I began to hear some gossip and some, some of the soldiers were talking about this man, this Philistine soldier who was, was basically challenging just one soldier to go out, one Israeli, it was Israeli soldier to go out and fight against him. And, and he said that if you will come out and you defeat me, then we will serve you. But if I defeat your soldier, then you Israelites must serve us Philistines. And so, obviously, the king was upset. King Saul, I knew him pretty well, and King Saul had made a promise to encourage and try to help someone step forward to do this. And so far, no one had done it, but he had set, promised a lot of money. He had promised him that one of his daughters could, would be given to him as a wife, and he had promised, this was a, kind of a bonus, he says, and I promise you that, that you're in your father's house, you'll not pay any more taxes for the rest of your father's life. Now, I didn't care about any of these things. I didn't care about the money, and I didn't care about getting married to some king's daughter or anything. But my dad, boy, he would like not paying taxes, at least the rest of his life. But that's not what motivated me. What ticked me off was that this Philistine had the audacity to stand before us, the people of God, and defy our God. 
That's what he was doing. And so I went to King Saul. I said, listen, King Saul, I'll sign up. I'll do it. I'll go out there. I'll fight this guy. And so King Saul, of course, he was a big tall guy, and I'm fairly short compared to him. He, he said, no, no, I don't think that's a good idea. You don't have any experience. You know, you're pretty young. You're pretty young, and you've never fought in the war, so it's not a good idea. And I said, but King, I've watched over my father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came to attack them, I rose up and I killed them. Just as the Lord has delivered me from the lion and the bear, he'll deliver me also from this Philistine who has defied your armies. The king told me, okay, Dave, I will let you go. But here, I want you to wear my armor. Put my armor on. You need some protection. I know you don't have any on your own. And so he put his armor on me and it, of course, touched the ground. I couldn't even move. It was going to work. And I said, no, thank you. This is not going to work. I took it off and I says, let me take what I am familiar with. And I went down to the stream and I found five smooth stones and I put them in a little pouch and I had my sling with me like I'd used against the lion and the bear and I went out to the battlefield. Now when this Philistine, his name was Goliath if you've not figured that out yet, he sees me coming, he says, oh, they're sending out a mere child to fight against me. Come over here and I'll make you out to be bird food. That's what he said. Well, I told him, you come with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord and the God of the armies of Israel. Today the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and you will be one who becomes bird food. <laughs> he didn't like that too much. I took one of my smooth stones and out of my pouch and I placed it in my sling and I, I prayed. I said, Lord, let this be true. And just as so often in the past, as I let go of my smooth stone, it went and it hit him right, boom, in the middle of the head. Knocked him silly. He fell to the ground. The Lord helped me hit him right where I needed to. And God's name was vindicated. And I just want you to know no one, and I mean no one, defies the Lord God and gets away with it. Now, the king was so grateful after this happened, and he made me a part of his army and everything, and I began leading some of his men. And over a period of time, I actually became in charge of the army, the, the great Israeli army, and, and uh, taking out in the battles against the Philistines. One of, his, uh, one of his sons became my best friend. His name was Jonathan. And over a period of time, as we had more and more battles and more and more successes, the people of Israel began to praise me. And they would say things like, you know, well, Saul has killed us thousands, but David has killed us tens of thousands. And when King Saul heard this, he wasn't too happy about it. He became very jealous. And one day while I was in the king's parlor there playing my harp to comfort him and so on, the king was thinking more and more about how David's killed his 10,000s and I've just killed my thousands. He took his spear and he threw it at me and he almost pinned me to the wall and I fled for my life. From that point on, King Saul began to, to use every opportunity to kill me. And I began to, to have to run and hide and, and there were some men that followed me and stayed with me and became faithful to me. So many times the, the king was about to, to, to find me and the Lord helped me escape. King Saul was just obsessed with the idea that he had to kill me. I remember one time, I actually had the opportunity to sneak into his camp in the middle of the night. And uh, I was standing right over him as he slept. And I thought about, well, I can just end this right now. I'll just, I'll just kill him on the spot. I thought, no, that's not what I need to do. I don't want to raise my hand and get kings anointed. So I took my sword and I just cut off a part of his robe. And I took it with me. And the next morning I called out from the ravine, over the ravine, I said, King Saul, you know, I had an opportunity last night to kill you. And I, I, I raised up this little corner robe. And he looked down and sure enough, he saw how I'd cut his robe. And it was interesting that the old King Saul came out who loved me as a son. And he, and he says, I'm so sorry, David, for what I've been doing. I'm so sorry I've been trying to kill you. But just this one promise, would you promise me not to kill any of, of my descendants? If you promise me that, I'll go home. Well, I said, sure, I, I, I promise you, I will not kill your descendants. And so Saul took up his men and he went back home. And I don't know, months passed, maybe a year or so passed, and we still hid because I just was not, I wasn't going to trust him anymore. 
But then I got word that King Saul was jealous again, and this time more jealous than ever. And this time he had 3,000 men that were coming with him. So once again, as they were camping and our men were kind of hiding, I snuck into camp again. Snuck back all those soldiers and, and God was with me. Maybe he did be shielding me. And instead of cutting his robe this time, I said, I'm going to take his sword. So I took King Saul's sword. Again, having the opportunity to kill him, I just took his sword and I went on over the other side. And then I called out to Abner, who was his personal bodyguard. I knew him personally. And I said, Abner, looky here, I've got the king's sword. You're not doing a very good job. And Saul heard me as I was yelling, and he says, is that you, David? And I says, it is my voice, my lord, my king. I asked him again, why are you seeking to kill me? What have I done to deserve death? Once again, I saw that old compassionate king that I'd known and loved in the past, and he said, I've sinned. Return, my son, David, for I will harm you no more because your, my life was precious in your sight. And that was the last time I saw King Saul. I heard later that he and his three sons went into the battle against the Philistines and all, three, all four of them were killed in battle. My heart was certainly dead, very broken over my friend Jonathan who had died in the battle. But I already knew because of previous information and things that I knew that God wanted me to be king someday and that I was to replace him. And it wasn't too long after that that Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, they said, listen, we want you to be our king. And they anointed me king. And about seven years later, the entire nation of Israel, because of my success, anointed me as their king. And for 40 years, I've served as the king of Israel. Now, I wish I could say that I completely was faithful in everything I did in serving the king. But when I was older, I committed a horrible sin. I made a mistake that I will regret for the rest of my life. Now, normally we'd go out, I'd go out with the men in the spring of the year to fight in the battles against the enemies. And this year I just, I'm going to stay home this year. So I stayed in the palace and one evening I went out on my patio and I looked out and I saw this beautiful woman that I'd never seen. And I asked about her. I inquired about who she was and they told me it was a, name, a lady named Bathsheba. They said she was a married woman. I said, I want you to bring her up here just so I get to know her. And, and well, one thing led to another and you probably can guess what happened. And I felt awful about it. But I thought, well, no, nobody will know. It'll be, nobody will know what happened. And a few weeks later, I found out she told me she was pregnant. And I tried to cover it up. I tried sending for her husband to come back. And it turned out that Uriah, her husband, was more honorable than I ever was. And he refused to, to be a part of my plan. So the next thing I did was inexcusable. I decided that I would take my general as they were going into the battle. And I would tell him, is get, make sure that Uriah is right in the front of the battle. And then kind of tell him to retreat. And in the heat of the battle, I felt like he'd be killed. And then my story would be covered up and no one would ever know. Well, it worked. But several other men were killed as well. And I began to thinking, it began to weigh on me how, because of what I had done, trying to cover up my story, I was a murderer. I had killed those men. I might as well have killed them myself. I was ashamed of what I had done. You see, the cover-up became worse than the actual sin itself. But I thought, well, nobody will know now. Just be me. But God knew. So I took this woman as a wife, and, and God let me wallow in my guilt for quite some time. And finally, he sent uh, a prophet named Nathan. Nathan was an honorable man, an honest man. I liked Nathan quite a bit. He prophesied the word so well. Nathan came to me and says, I got a situation that's come up I need you to deal with. He says, there's a, there's a man in our kingdom, your kingdom. He's a very poor man, but he has this one little lamb. And his neighbor, very wealthy man, he has many, many lambs. And not too long ago, uh, this man, this wealthy man's friend came to see him. And instead of taking one of his lambs and killing it to, for the feast that he wanted to provide for his, his friend, he went next door and he took that one little man's lamb. And he killed it, and he provided the feast. Well, of course, I was a shepherd. I, you know, my background. And when I heard his story, I was furious. I says, where is he? We're gonna, I'll deal with this. And then he pointed to me and says, you're the man. It was like a bolt of lightning hit me because I realized exactly what he was doing. He was confronting me about my sin against the Lord. It wasn't too long after that 
that I wrote the 51st Psalm as you know it. I wrote things like, my sin is ever before me. In sin my mother conceived me. You desire truth in my inward parts. I was broken to the core. Now I cried out, created me a clean heart, O God. Restore the joy of my salvation. And you know what happened? God did. The joy returned. He forgave me. I, I think I learned more about God and myself in that greatest failure of my life than all the other successes. I did still suffer the consequences of my sin. You see, what you reap, you do so. But however, I learned so many amazing things about God's grace. One of them you're very familiar with. These are the words that God inspired me to write. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me in the spot beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So what are some of the greatest takeaways from the life of King David? Well, the first thing I want to share with you is I believe the best courage is found only in God. I want to say that again. The best courage is found only in God. I'm sure there's courageous men and courageous women over the, over the centuries have, have given their lives and been willing to give their lives for all kinds of causes. But what good is it for you to have correct, great courage and die for a cause and God not be that cause that you're, you're doing? You die for naught. But David was a courageous man, but his courage was founded totally in his faith in God. Notice again, he was so convinced about his faith in God that he knew that one day he would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I hope you have that same assurance. I hope you have that same faith. Surely God will give me mercy to follow me all days of my life, but someday I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Think about it. No one, not even great King Saul, had the courage to go against Goliath, but David did. And it was because of his courage was so grounded in the word and the faith of God. Now, I don't know about you, but it's a great week for me to have vacation. Oh, it's so good to be away and get away from all things and everything. But you can't get away from the world. I mean, they had the shooting, the school shooting in Texas. They're talking about it all week. And there was another shooting in Tulsa. And then... Ukraine. I mean, all this stuff going on and gasoline went from 429 to 479 while we we're gone. You notice that? Um, inflation. It's kind of getting scary. You know, COVID still talked about some and it's been a very scary thing for a couple years. We live in a scary world and it's not getting a lot better. But I'm telling you, we need to be courageous like David. We need to found our faith in him so that we can be courageous for whatever lies ahead. The, the second thing I want to share with you this morning is the best way to fight is with your own rocks. What would happen if David had gone out there to try to fight Goliath in the king's armor? He would have probably been killed. You see, God has given each of us a special gift and special skills and we need to learn to use what God has given us rather than to try to use what God has given somebody else. Why do you think David had the experience of protecting his father's sheep? Lion attacks or a bear attacks and David had learned the skills to fight them off and to even kill them if necessary. Well, I think God was preparing David for the day he would face Goliath. You see, God is using my past God is using your past to prepare you for what lies ahead. Now, I've not always appreciated the storms in my life and the difficulties that I've had to face. But when I get to a day when my, something happens and I have skills or I have the ability that God has given me to overcome another storm, I say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I think that's what 
you know, the, the, the thing that David had was his, his, his slingshot and his, and his smooth stones. Third thing I see here, even courageous people can fall. Even courageous people can fall. Now, David, the Bible says, was God's most favorite king. David loved God with all of his heart. And he proves it over and over and over again. And God loved David so much, he promised David, he says, a descendant of, of yours will always sit on the throne of Israel forever. Now, that's quite a promise. David was a murderer. He was an adulterer. In fact, just as David was one of the, he was one of the greatest Old Testament believers, he still had these marks that God's word tells us about for a reason. Another murderer in the New Testament wrote half the New Testament. His name was Paul. Now, how can this be? I'll tell you how it can be. It's because God can use anyone to do great things. All of us are sinners, and there is nothing we can do that God cannot forgive, and he can pick up the pieces for us to do more mighty things for him. And that's the lesson of David. You know who the one is that's trying to get us to quit? It's the devil. The devil makes you look at your failures. They've been, they've been paid for on the cross and all this, but the devil wants you to focus on him. He wants you to stop. He wants you to quit. He wants you to stop serving God. But God wants you to seek him and ask for his forgiveness and be restored and go out and fight another day. David wrote that God can restore our souls. Why? Because God restored his soul. Fourth thing I see here is when God confronts sin, courageous people become broken. You know, in, in brokenness, I think brokenness takes the strongest possible courage there is in all, all fairness. When our courage is founded in pleasing God, when we fail, our failure is not the end. Our failure is the beginning point for God to do something new in our lives. And he takes that which we've done as a failure and he turns it to excess for him. That's what it means by all things work together for good to them that are called according to his purpose. See, God doesn't meet us with a whip in his hand when we failed him. God meets us with open arms ready to forgive us and love us back to where we need to be. But unless we're broken over our sin, we're not going to receive the grace that God wants to give us. I want you to listen to the brokenness in David's confession. Again, this is Psalm 51. He begins with asking for God's mercy and for him to wash and cleanse him from all sin. He admits that he had done evil in God's sight. He asked God to purge him with hyssop and to wash him whiter than snow. As it turns out, hyssop is a, is a herb that they used in, in the Jewish day that was a great herb for cleaning things. It, was just, it just had clean, a great cleansing effect. And they also believed that the whitest white was snow. That's what the Jew believed. The whitest white was snow. You think about it. We get a good snowstorm and the sun's out bright. It's blinding, right? David's saying, I want you to take hyssop as a cleansing agent and I want you to cleanse me whiter than snow. In other words, he was saying, I want to be completely forgiven. I want to be completely holy. I want to be completely back into your service. That, these are words of a broken, broken man. The fifth thing I see is that God pours himself into broken people. Even as a young man, David was a courageous man. And I believe that in order to be a, a follower of God, and to, you've got to be broken from the beginning. You've got to be humble. You're not a prideful person. You're a humble person to follow God in the first place. And David believed in God, and he, and he knew he served God. But he was not fully broken until he had this grievous sin with Bathsheba. Now, it's believed that David wrote about half the book, half the entire Psalms, about 75 of them. Most of them, I think, was written, were written after he had this time of brokenness. Of course, the most famous, even the world knows, if you ask him anything about Psalm 23, most people know something about Psalm 23. So as David reflects over his life, he presents the Lord as a caring shepherd for his sheep. And of course, it's got all kinds of profound truth. I've preached on it many times in many different ways. But let me just look and zero in on the brokenness in the Psalm. There are several clues. The first clue was when David writes, the Lord restores my soul. 
You can't be restored unless you need to be restored. He had done something. His fellowship with God was broken and he needed that restoration and he, and he prays, God, restore my soul. He also says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know what the rod was used for, for from a shepherd? The rod was for correction. The rod was used to keep that sheep from doing something, maybe going in a place that would be harmful or something, and they would smack him with the rod for correction. What did God use to correct David? He used prophet Nathan to tell him a story. He, Nathan came up with a story from God about a shepherd, about, about a sheep, because he knew how important he thought sheep were, and he, he would catch it. He wouldn't understand it. You will never become the person God wants you to be until you're fully broken. I think one of my favorite guys in the New Testament is Peter. I love Peter. My man Peter kept, man, he, his pride got in his way all the time. All the time he was messing up, doing this. So when the night came for him to stand with his Lord, he did. He went to be with Jesus. He was there. He was the only one in the, in the courtyard there when they were trying Jesus. The problem was he'd been bright, prideful and he'd been talking about how you know, he wasn't fully broken. And so when someone came up to him and says, aren't you one of his disciples? Oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know him. No, no. Second time, oh, I think you are. Aren't you one of his disciples? Oh, no, I don't know. I'm not one of his disciples. And then a third time, a little slave girl of all things comes up. You're a Galilean. I'm pretty sure you're one of Jesus' disciples. And he, I began, Peter began to cuss and say, I do not, I swear I don't know him. What happened? Do you remember what happened? Immediately the cock crowed, and immediately Peter's heart was broken. The Bible says it was broken like a little baby, and he went out and wept like a baby. I think Peter was broken that night, and he became a stronger person. Jesus had already told him, you're going to do it. But you want to know something, Peter? I've already prayed for you that when you do this, you're going to come out stronger on the other side. And guess what? He did. He did. God pours himself into broken people. And one more thing. Brokenness opens the door to godly wisdom. You know, in this world, and this world is a mess, godly wisdom is like finding a gold mine in a sewer. This world stinks. I'm going to be honest with you. But when you get godly wisdom, it's like a gold mine. Now, please understand me. David was broken long before his sin with Bathsheba. He, you have to be broken to be even a believer in God. But his sin with Bathsheba marked a turning point in his life in which he became fully broken and realized what a failure he was and, by, uh, and, and how in his sin he was just deserving of being separated from God. It wasn't until David, I think, fully realized that what he had done, he should die for. Because if you commit adultery or you commit murder in that day, the Ten Commandments said, you must die for those crimes. And so David realized that. God forgave him. But David, in that moment, realized that he truly deserved to die and pay for his sins. And he was fully broken. He deserved that. Now, I've had a number of times in my own personal life when this has happened, but there's one that stands out to me that was life-changing. I was actually preaching a message. This was 30-something years ago, and I was in, in Georgia, and I was preaching through the seven last sayings of Christ right before Easter. And I came to that one uh, where Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And just in the moment when it came out, those words came out of my mouth, For some reason, God hit me that the reason that Jesus was forsaken was because of me. It was my sin that caused Jesus to be forsaken by God the Father. And I became emotional, and I still think about it. And, and I, I struggled through. I don't know if you remember, Mary, but I struggled through to get the, I couldn't wait to get the end of the message just so I could go out and weep and cry. And I kind of snuck out the side door after the service was over. And I just, I, for some reason, realized, you know what? I deserve the cross. I deserve all that Jesus took on. You deserve, I don't care how good you think you are. I, don't, I haven't ever killed anybody. You know, there, I've had, I've, had, I've broken all the Ten Commandments, but not in the, they're not in the literal way. 
but I know that I deserve to die for my sins. And I'm broken over that fact that Jesus died in my place. Brokenness opens the door for godly wisdom. And godly wisdom is seeing things as God sees them. And for that moment in my life, I for the first time saw my sin for what it truly was. And that was it deserved to be punished by eternal separation from God. One more thing. Godly wisdom manifests itself through grateful living. How are we going to thank God for all that Jesus has done for us? Well, David says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In spite of all his failures, all of his successes, whatever, his whole life, he realized, you know what? Because of my faith in God, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why do we have the story of David? I think it's to help us understand a man that's got a whole heart for God can still fail because all of us are sinners. All of us need that same grace to be saved, the same mercy in order to escape flames of hell so this is why what I came to is this one conclusion no matter what my lot is no matter what my personal sufferings may be the one song in my heart is surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever Now, as Brian said a few moments ago, I want you to see a little clip. I was just sitting in my bed.